Hello, Johnny London here, and today I want to talk to you about the boater's best friend, which is, of course, the stove. Now, I haven't used this for a little while. It's been summertime, or the British version of summertime anyway. Uh, in fact, the last time I used it, um, I did have to light it a couple of times in June, which is unusual. I think it got to sort of like 16 and a half, 17 degrees on a couple of evenings. We had an unusually cold week or two. But anyway, I haven't used it since then. And what I normally like to do before the next winter starts up, or, you know, early autumn in this case, I like to give it all a good clean. I'm going to sweep it all out, check all the seals, check the fire bricks, and then I'm going to give it a nice black with some of this stuff. So plenty to do. And while I do that, I want to talk to you about the install because this is actually my own install. And I've got a few photos of when I did that and I can sort of pop them into the video and we can have a little look how I built the hearth, how I did the sides, um, you know, all to keep the heat from getting to stuff, uh, how I fitted the flue. And also we can go outside and have a look at the flue if it's not raining. Uh, whereupon I can sweep the chimney as well, which would be good. So we're going to do all that and uh, I think the best thing to do is just get started. going to get as much of the muck from in there to go down into the ash pan as possible. The thing is, I don't want to stir the dust up too much because it will be all over the boat. Um, but you can't really use a hoover with this sort of thing, though it would work and it would be quite satisfying. I have done this in the past. All that happens is you end up blocking up all your hoover and hoover filters and everything, and then that's a right hassle. So I'll just do it this way as best I can. Well, I've got as much of the dust into the ash pan as possible. I'm going to go and empty that out. Now what I'm trying to do is take all the sort of grate and things out. But it was a trick to this and I can't remember what it is. Ah, could it be that simple? I think so. Now there's actually a thing called a baffle plate in the top of most stoves. And I think this one just sort of rests on top of the fire bricks. There it comes. I need to take that out um, because if I want to sweep the chimney properly it'll um, obstruct the brush. There he is, it's just a big piece of uh, cast iron but we'll take that outside and brush that off in a moment. Ooh. Mucky, mucky old job I'm afraid. Right. Everything that can be removed has been removed. I've shut the doors uh, because I don't want all the plumes of dust billowing out all over the boat. Annoyingly, I've just had a really good deep clean and dust of everything in here a few days ago. So should have done things in a different order really. But anyway, it's not raining at the moment. So I'm going to go outside with my special brush and uh, brush the chimney. I always keep the chimney stack on, except when I'm cruising. When I'm cruising, I just take it off and lie it on the roof for obvious reasons. There's always low branches and so on. There is a cap that came with this chimney. I could just put a cap over there for the summer to keep the rain out. But I don't trust myself to one evening go, oh, it's a bit chilly, like I was saying before that I did in June a couple of times unexpectedly bung some wood in the fire and light it and then wonder why the room's filling with smoke. So I always like to have this, you know, in an open state as it were. So if I suddenly decide to light the fire, you know, maybe I've had a couple of beers, who knows, then there's not going to be a problem. You see people putting plastic buckets over, uh, carrier bags with elastic bands, all kinds of things to keep the rain out, which is fair enough. 
um, but you do need to remember that they're on there if you're going to light the fire so that's the way I like to do it anyway here's the brush it's just the right size brush for the job I do this at least once every season and to be honest you don't get that much out you know there's not going to be a big bag full of soot emptying itself out down there I'm just feeling that's it that's all the way through now which is just as well and then back up again hardly anything really I'll just do it once more just to be sure what can happen is the waste combustion products and the soot and what have you it can still be very slightly combustible so it sticks to the inside of the flue or the chimney it's just the flue in this case and if you have a really hot fire one day and you've got a lot of that old crud in there it can actually sort of combust again then you get a chimney fire and apparently that's like a massive roaring whooshing sound and then you realize your chimney's caught fire and the best thing to do is turn off all the air to the stove and try and control it down like that and probably call the fire brigade but anyway that's done very little muck in there i think we'll find out when i go back in in a moment back on jobs are good and Right, let's have a look and see how much muck came out after that sweeping. Um, there's just a really tiny little bit of really dark black powder, not the grey stuff, the sort of burnt wood ash that's in there. A completely different looking sort of stuff. I suppose that's exactly the sort of stuff that if you get too much of it can end up catching fire of itself. Oh, it's a very mucky business this. I wouldn't want to be a chimney sweep. And still it comes. Actually, I found um, just at the top of the stove, right up in there under the, under the roof of the stove, I found quite a lot more of that sort of black cruddy stuff. So I swept all that off. That's not too bad actually, because it's quite heavy and it just drops straight down. It doesn't make dust. It's completely different stuff to the... Um, the wood ash. I bought this on eBay second hand. Um, I paid about uh, 200 or 250 quid, I can't remember now. But the great thing about these stoves, and in fact most stoves in general, as long as you don't go for a sort of cheapo new brand, you can always get all the spare parts. For example, this one, someone had already fitted a new glass to it, so I didn't have to worry about that. But typically, if you buy a second hand stove, you'll probably need the glass, the ropes, the fire bricks and possibly part of the grate. Any of the bits that can wear out really, but they're all available and they're not too expensive. Now the fire bricks, they're made out of a kind of, you know, some kind of brick-like ceramic and they're made to a certain shape, so only the certain fire bricks will fit this. You can get vermiculite ones which are very, very light, and they're the ones that are most commonly found when you're looking online. The reason for that is because they're cheap to post, because they're light, but you can get posted to you the proper ceramic heavyweight ones, brick-like brick, if you will, and they're the ones I always go for. I've refurbed a couple of stoves in my time. So I've got new fire bricks. Um, they were probably about 25 quid a set, I don't know. They're cut to a certain shape. And I bought this thing, it's the, the middle part of the grate, uh, the bit that moves around when you riddle it. Um, the old one was all just all cracked and fallen to bits and worn out. And I think that was 15 or 20 quid. Again, you'll probably get a bit of glass for 15 or 20 quid. And the fire rope, if you need to redo your seals, the fire rope is available in different sizes. So, I mean, obviously this one's all squashed in now. It's quite difficult to tell what size it is, but say, for example, you want six millimeter or eight millimeter or whatever it is, you can buy, you know, a meter or a couple of meters of that online. And that's only a few pounds. And then you use special stuff to stick it on with like a little pot of white glue that's, you know, obviously a high temperature glue, you know, that probably about another five or eight quid or something like that. Total cost of refurb, 89.45. So what I've decided to do 
is err on the side of caution. I'm just going to give the glass a clean from here. The seal on it's fine and the clips on it are fine so I'll just give it a nice clean and then we can move on. Right everything's uh, all been wiped down with a wet cloth or two now so I've got all the dust and muck off and I'm actually ready to sort of apply my stove black onto the stove and I also want to do a little bit of something with these tiles just to clean them up. When I installed them I sealed them with some uh, boiled linseed oil so I'm going to see if I can find that and just give them a wipe over with that just to freshen them up a bit. Well here's the stuff I was talking about boiled linseed oil. I had this for ages actually because it goes over such a long way. I put a glove on because it's a bit uh, it's sort of solventy. I'm just going to uh, put some onto a cloth and just give it a light wipe over all the tiles. I'm not going to you know, try and coat it too thickly or anything, just to freshen it up as I said. I know I should have started at the back and worked my way forward, but the truth is I like doing the easy bit first. The bit where you get to see the results. Well that didn't take long, a quick coat of boiled linseed oil. Time for a bit of hot spot on the old stove. Let's see what that comes out like, eh? Once again, be sure to work from the easiest, most accessible parts. This is ideal, toothbrush for getting into all the little nooks and crannies. Mind you, I've got to use that later. Well that's most of the hard work done, so I'm just going to give you a little chat now about the construction of this uh, installation. What I did was, I wanted to make sure everything was completely fireproof, so the half all I did was I simply cut out the plywood of the floor to leave a hole the size that I wanted it to be. Then I put bricks down. Then after that I put breeze blocks. I was then able to put the tiles on. And that made for a good solid half. This bit, the rear wall, what I did was cut the plywood away because I didn't want any wood directly in contact with the calcium silicate board that I would be using. So I now have a calcium silicate board that's tiled in front of and an air gap behind. I also tiled under here taking away the original wood trim just in case that was a bit of a heat trap. I've since found this doesn't get very hot at all and I'd be happy enough putting back that piece of wood trim that I took out. When I tiled on the calcium silicate board it seemed quite powdery to me so I sealed it with PVA glue. And these tiles have stayed on very well. Now the stove has two little brackets that go on the back of the feet they're just bolted into the half, there's nothing to see. And the flue, I bought that as a kit. It's a twin wall flue, which means it holds the heat in well, so the outer wall doesn't get that hot. You can pretty much touch that like that uh, with your hand when, it's, when the stove's roaring away. The only thing that the Morso flue kit didn't include was this cover plate for the inner ceiling. I'd cut plenty of wood and insulation away from near the flue and left a good gap which needed covering. I purchased a 1.5mm steel offcut from a local metal place and cut it to shape, allowing a millimetre or so for expansion around the flue. I then cut that into two parts so I could fit it around the flue which was obviously already in place. Satin black spray paint was used for the finish and galvanised screws were used to fix the plate onto the wood. 
So the total for the fireplace build looks like this. Bricks was £6, breeze blocks were £8, tiles were £22 and tile adhesive was £14.99. Calcium silicate boards came in at £64 and the high temperature silicon was £4.98. Satin spray paint was £6.99 and the steel plate was £2. The total for the fireplace build came to £128.96. So that leaves just one other thing, and that was the actual hole to cut into the ceiling or the roof of the boat itself, the actual steel. Now my boat's made of six millimeter steel for the roof, and here it is. Uh, I cut this out by first of all, drilling a series of little holes through that you can see there. That was more just to mark where the circle was because I marked it out from the inside. I already knew exactly where I was going from the inside because I had the stovepipe mocked up and I knew where it wanted to go. So I drew a circle for that. I did all the little holes through with a drill that was easy and then transferred the shape of the circle to the outside of the boat. Now I say a circle, it's not absolutely totally a perfect circle because the roof is at an angle to the pipe. So it's very slightly not a circle if you think about it. So that's why I did it like that rather than just saying, oh, it's, you know, 15 mil, uh, 15 centimeters or something like that. And, you know, doing it that way. I wanted to have it in a, in a very, very slight ellipse. Then I drilled one hole that was big enough to put a jigsaw blade into. Now drilling this sort of metal is quite easy, but you do need to go up through the drill sizes like you were taught at school in metalwork. I hated metalwork and I never took any notice, but I remembered this and now I know why. It's because when you put the point of the drill onto something, it is only the very point that can cut because it's a, it's a massive drill bit, I should say. You're just wasting It's in contact with anything. So if you try and start out with a massive, that provides a little sort of circular deep into, so to speak, and then a bigger one after that. Anyway, that's how to drill a hole, and I found out the hard way because I burnt out plenty of drill bits when I first moved the board, you know, trying to fit locks and what have you. Uh, in the end, I realised what they told me at school was correct. Go up through the sizes because that's the only way it will really work when you're cutting proper steel. Now, when I came to do the jigsaw, that was um, that surprised me. I didn't know if I was going to be able to cut it like that. I didn't know if I was going to be able to move the tool around in a tight enough radius, but metal blade, uh, sort of, uh, you know, trying to make it go as quickly as possible and burn it. I just took it really, really slow, really, really slow. Cuts in enough to get a special man in to cut it. And in the end, there's just um, bog standard jigsaw, bog standard jigsaw metal blades, nothing special, and just went round and cut that out very, very easily. I've just got a little bit of finishing off to do, as you can see. That's always the way with these things. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think that's about it. I'm just going to pop the rest of the bits back, give that a wipe down, and I think we're done. I've got a new one. It smells a bit different, though. Right, just put the grate back now. There's a trick to these. Um, they're not symmetrical. It's got a gap on one side, and that's where the riddling mechanism goes. And if you don't know that, and I've had trouble with this in the past, it's easy to put it in the wrong way and then spend a long time struggling. It's still not exactly easy, mind. But there it is. Dust box. That goes in there. Where's the baffle? Ah, now, which way does this go? Like that. It's got two little lugs to rest on at the bottom end. And there she goes. The cost for the whole project looks like this. The Morso stove was £231, the stove refurb £89.45 and the flue kit £502.88. The fireplace builder £128.96 brings the grand total to £952.29. The sundry items I already had. And here we are, a fireplace to be proud of. In next 
week's episode. I say goodbye to the Kenneth and Avon as I pass through Reading Town Centre, through the Kennet mouth, and on to the Thames. <laughs>